Okay. Um, thank you for your patience. Um, and thank you for joining us this morning. In the interest of your time and respecting your time for being on time, we're going to go ahead and get started and allow people to trickle in as time goes on. Um, to make sure that you're in the right place, you are here for the Communicating About Health Equity, Showing the Bigger Picture to Build Healthier Communities, um, presented by Berkeley Media Studies Group. So we, in support of the California Department of Public Health, specifically the NEOP branch, um, we, the Public Health Institute and the Children and Youth Team, are very happy to introduce our sister organization, Berkeley Media Studies Group, BMSG. Um, we at the Children and Youth Team are really excited about having BMSG come for this opportunity today to share some of the knowledge that they have. Um, Lloyd Nadal, um, manager of the Children and Youth Team, really wanted to um, be here today, but he sends his regards he had to be at another engagement. Lloyd, Susan, and myself have the highest respect and gratitude for Berkeley Media Studies Group for the expertise that they bring um, to all the work that they do. We specifically work with them directly to help support communication strategies um, around getting young people involved statewide in the efforts that we're making to make this state a, a healthier state. Um, it's um, a really great opportunity to share that expertise across the board for all the great work that we're doing. So with that, um, I'm excited to introduce to you Julieta and Fernando. Julieta? Thank you so much, Mitria. We are so happy to be here as well. It's really wonderful to partner with you all and support your work as you are doing all the difficult work on the ground, moving and changing to address some of the issues that are keeping our kids from realizing their full potential. So we are very happy to be here. So I'm just going to start off with some housekeeping notes. My name is Julieta Guzmid. I am a strategic communication specialist here at Berkeley Media Studies Group. My background is in journalism. I have about 15 years of radio experience, and I also have a master's in public health. We're focused on communicating effectively to push forth community change. So that's something that has been a focus for me. And I'm going to let Fernando introduce himself in a moment, but first, we're going to go over a couple technical um, logistical support questions. So um, if anyone has any um, tech problems, please um, feel free to call the number that you see on your screen. Um, that number is available at any point. And um, throughout this webinar, we will ask for you all to participate. We're going to ask for that in a couple different ways. Some people are more comfortable typing in. We've already had some people ask some questions. Thank you. I see the question about the slides and whether or not they're available. So the whole webinar will be archived and be available for people to refer to after the fact. In terms of actual um, PDF versions of the slides, we're happy to provide those to you if you send us an email so you'll have our contact information at the end of this presentation. So we're going to ask for your participation in two different ways. One, using the chat, chat function, which you can see it's a little speech bubble, and then you just type in there. But we do want to underline that we want everyone to click, make sure it sends to all participants. Sometimes people will send it, and it only, you know, it would, we don't get to see it. So please make sure that your message is sent to all participants. The other way we're going to ask you to participate is through actually being unmuted and raising your hand and saying your comment or, or asking your question out loud. And we know that some things are a little hard to summarize in a few sentences, and it may be easier or you're more comfortable just saying it out loud. That's great. You can do that by raising your hand. So you can see in this slide, it shows that little, um, at the, above the chat, there's a little hand that's next to a phone, and it's raise hand. So that's the way that we know, because everyone right now is currently muted, that's the way we can quickly unmute you and you know, call your name, and you can participate verbally, and that's a great way for you to be involved. So we just wanted to put those two housekeeping notes um, out and get those two housekeeping notes out of the way, and we really um, look forward to spending this time with you all. So Berkeley Media Studies Group is really focused on providing support to to advocates and to community health makers that are that's dedicated to push forth healthier communities, and that happens in a lot of different ways. So for us, we know that the way, what people understand about the work we do, what they know about diabetes, what they know about physical activity or, or 
obesity or what they know about healthy foods, et cetera, much of that is shaped through the media. So Berkeley Media Studies Group spends some time really analyzing the way different health issues are covered in the media. We then provide strategic communication support, so that can look like a, everything from reviewing materials and support with messaging to helping groups come up with a strategic communications plan and really envision what they should be doing between six and 12 months and three to five years. And we also train journalists. So those are the different areas that we find ourselves plugging in and supporting the work that you all do. So what we'll be, do, what we'll be doing today is sharing some of the basic tools that we think are essential when messaging, and specifically when talking about health equity. We got a chance to really sit down and look at some of the many issue areas you all are working on, and that's all those issue areas really are health equity issues, because they're addressing the fact that people, it's not everyone's affected the same way by, in terms of access to healthy foods and physical activity. That is very real. So, um, so we're going to spend some time chatting with, sharing with you all some tips and tools to make sure that you're including a health equity lens and to really think about how do you communicate to decision makers to have the power to move forward and make the changes that you hope to see. So we're going to really go over some of the key components of that messaging. And this is something that we recommend for these issue areas, but also um, not just for these issue areas, but anything else you do in the future. These are really role, uh, some, some tips that we think translate beyond uh, beyond just um, what you're working on now. All right, so I'm going to let Fernando Quintero introduce himself and then take it away with our, our introduction to material. Thank you, Julieta. Um, you all may note that in the speaking um, window, it shows my name flashing. Just a uh, clarification, that was Julieta talking right now, <laughs> and we're sharing a phone line. So we'll both uh, You'll hear both of our voices, and you'll probably see just my name flashing, so just a clarification there. Um, so today, uh, we're talking about health equity, and we all want to start with a common, uh, some common definitions or understanding of what health equity is, since many of us may have different ideas about what just what that means. So we wanted to start with um, participants just sending their own um, their own definitions, their own ideas about what this term health equity means. So using the chat function, uh, you can uh, uh, give us your response, or you can type in your response, or you can raise your hand and say it out loud. So you can either raise your hand or type it in the chat box. Absolutely. So we're going to give uh, folks just a few minutes to think about this um, this idea of health equity. So we can just uh, start with some common ideas and definitions and then move forward. So we'll give folks just a couple of minutes. And for some groups, maybe it's not a definition that you use, but a metaphor that commonly you reference. So if you have that, then, then please share it. Thanks, Charlene, for starting that off, starting us off. Exactly. So Charlene uh, Ramont uh, says, health equity to her means creating conditions that allow everyone to reach their full health potential. And that's an excellent uh, start to our conversation about what health equity means. Great, we have a couple more here um, from Martin uh, Frigard. Uh, the differences in access to health services environments across populations. So uh, here we're talking about that term equity and what is equitable when we're looking at different conditions, different resources that are available to some communities and not to others. Uh, from Linda Helen, uh, we, uh, we get equal opportunity for all to thrive and live a healthy life. That's a great statement that includes an important value when we often talk about um, 
our messages, and we'll, and we'll touch on that a little bit later, but the value of, of everyone having an equal opportunity to thrive is an important one. From Ruben Brambila, uh, we have developing an infrastructure to ensure that all population groups have ideal opportunities to live healthier lifestyles. Uh, we're getting some more great, um, some more great uh, definitions here or ideas from Heather Chris having access the same level of quality food, medical care, education to all, crossing all economic lines equally. So here's a great example of how uh, when we're talking about health equity, it really means our entire environment and not just the, the um, standard idea of health, but also our educational resources, our housing, all the other things that, uh, that help us lead healthy lives. And so Fernando just pulled out one thing that we're going to be talking about throughout the day, which is values, and that's really key. So we're going to pull, circle back to that, and we really want to underline that most of these messages contain really strong values that speak to us on a core level. And so we're going to go back to that. I also want to underline that a lot of these different definitions are very specific and offer, don't just say, well, everyone have, it doesn't end with just everyone having access, but for example, Heather's access to the same quality food, medical care, education, that's something we can all picture and visualize. And we want to be able to do that as often as we can because most people actually outside of our world don't actually, they don't use the term health equity too often. Our grandkids, if we have them, our grandparents, if we, if we could chat with them, they probably wouldn't know what that term necessarily means. Equ health equity, equity oftentimes people think about the value in their house. So that's why we have to be, we have to start with no assumptions, and we can't assume that people know what we're talking about. So we have to be very clear and try to avoid jargon whenever possible. So we're going to learn from each other and really take the opportunity to, um, to borrow and pull from some of these, because there's not one straight definition that each organization is working on health equity in a different way. So we don't want to be prescriptive and say this is the right way to do it because it's different in every single community, rural, urban, depending on your context and your goals. But it, what is essential is that it's something that translates across um, outside of your specific sector. So it can't be something that only people in the health department understand. So thank you everyone to, um, for, you could feel free to continue to share your definitions and um, we're going to keep giving some feedback on these as, because it's a really important starting point. Great. So why are, why, why are we starting this conversation anyway and why is it so essential to define health equity? Um, health equity is something that we're all working towards, but even though everyone on this call probably is very clear as to why they care, we have to make the case and paint the larger social picture of why this matters. So that brings us to this conversation around the scale. So most people who receive, so the way most people receive their information about health or social issues is either through the media or through their own lived experience. So most people when in our society, our society, 90% um, of news, 80% of news coverage points to social issues and social problems as being primarily, um, the, the individual being primarily responsible for their health or social issues. What I mean by that is when, we, when there's been media analysis of health stories, for example, type 2 diabetes, um, the percentage of news stories that focus on the factors, uh, um, the factors outside of a person's control that impact whether or not they're healthy, for example, you know, access to to health, to nutrition, physical activity, to, you know, tobacco control, as, as Kyla typed in, um, et cetera. These factors that we all know very, you know, very clearly impact people's ability to be healthy are, are ignored in most news coverage. So most people, when they think about why someone is unhealthy, for example, if someone is living with type 2 diabetes, most news stories and most of the narrative of our country really points the fact that, well, it must be something internal. It must be that someone just doesn't have the willpower, isn't really just, maybe they just don't care enough. Exactly. They're just making bad choices. Yes. So they're just, they're just um, that's the focus. And so um, we, we want to make sure that when we paint the story of the factors that impact people's health, 
we really try to tell a more balanced story. We try to make the scale look more like what it looks like in this photo, which is more even, because everyone we're talking to and communicating with is going to assume that if someone's unhealthy, if someone's having trouble in school, if we have kids that are just getting bad grades, you know, it's not about school discipline policies. It's not about maybe looking at um, school foods and um, whole, whether or not people have, young people are experiencing trauma. It's really about whether or not the kid wants to learn. And we all know there are many factors that impact whether or not a child can learn. So when we define health equity, it's really essential that we put that, we broaden the frame. So we talk about the landscape, the many factors outside of a person's control that impact their health, not just the portrait, the story that's just focused on the individual. So we don't just focus on if they're sick, it's their fault. We all know this, but we need to tell this larger story because that's where most people are going to go to. They're going to go to that default frame. They're going to go to common assumptions, and that's why we need to be clear that when we're using messages and even when we're defining health equity, we're taking into account people's starting points because that starting point is not going to be the same as, for, as the one that we're coming to this work as people who understand the systems and structures that impact our lives. So how can we get better at this? Because it's really tough. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to talk to neighbors, family members, um, you know, people at your kids' schools about the work you do and why you're trying to change these different systems and structures. And they well, why don't you just do more health education? Well, one tool that we offer is to really phys make the physical, show how the external becomes internal. So this is a slide that we have um, that we're using that's through the Alameda County Health Department. They've done a great job thinking about how to talk about health equity and specifically how to talk about health inequity in manifest in the body. So oftentimes people will say, well, I just don't, you know, that's great that you want to make it easier for kids to walk to school. That's important. But, you know, how is that an equity issue? And here you can see transportation. So, you know, it's one thing if you're stuck in traffic. We all have been stuck in traffic. You're stuck in traffic for an hour. It, has a, it can be stressful, makes you tense, you know, makes, it, makes you just a little wound up. It can cause you in all these different consequences, raise your heart rate, make your blood pressure go up. But imagine if you're stuck on the bus for two hours, twice a day, every day. And you know your child is waiting for you, and you've worked a 14-hour shift. We all know that this is a weathering effect. It's like a, a barn that's being rained on. You know, one night, you know, you, it's it's intense, and you worry about the roof, but you can take it. But day in, day out, storm after storm, it really adds up. And that's what happens here when we have all these different factors: air quality, segregation, and segregation is something that we know, you know, that can when people feel unsafe or they're feeling that it's, it's difficult for them to walk outside their house, it's something they carry with them. Housing, crime, education, we can all make the case of how these things manifest physically. Stress, as we all know, it's, it's, a very, it's ter used colloquially, oh, I'm so stressed out, but we know it physically makes an impact on our body and affects our ability to thrive and, and survive, actually. So we definitely want to paint this larger picture and show the interconnectedness of how all these different issues impact people's health, and that's that's our job to do because even sometimes we're working with people, like our own community. We're doing we're doing workshops around. Yes, we really need to address the fact that there's mobile vending in this area that's unhealthy in the food, and it can feel like, well, why this one thing? Why this one thing? This isn't going to make all the difference. You want to get rid of chips right here? I don't get it. Why? Well, the reason we want to talk about that is, this is I think this metaphor is, is a useful one. It's this idea of the bird cage. So, yes, it's true. Chips being available on every corner, chips have, kids having unhealthy foods, being swimming in unhealthy foods, that is not the only factor that is affecting our community's health by any means. And we don't want to ever assume that it's one thing, that there's a silver bullet and we can just address health inequity and that's going to just solve the problem but it's one bar in a cage. This little bird you can see is stuck in a cage, and it's stuck in this cage because of all these many factors. Those factors are all the ones we've mentioned um, that highlight and lead to high stress. So yes, it's true that taking down, taking one bar in that cage, the, the bird is still going to be stuck in the cage, and that's very unfortunate. But together, we need to work to address, to dismantle this cage so the bird can be healthy and free. So 
John, we really, you know, work and really respect the work of John Powell, who uh, we recommend a, um, for further reading around health equity. He has a lot of great metaphors and strategies on how to work towards um, a more equitable society and thinking about all these issues and how they intersect. And his quote, opportunities are produced and regulated by institutions and how um, and, it, and institutional interactions and individuals together. So it's all these many factors. So that's part of our job. So when we're working with community members, when we're working with decision makers, when we're working with staff members, and people will say, I don't understand. Why are we spending so much time talking about daycare, food and daycare? I mean, there are a lot of issues in my community. Well, yes, there are. And this is one bar in the cage. And it's our duty to really try to dismantle this cage. So what happens when we talk about health inequity or health inequality? Um, there are some common sort of pitfalls that we often fall into when we try to discuss this idea of uh, uh, an unlevel playing field. And unfortunately, when we're talking about health inequity or health inequality, our audience often goes to that default frame that um, Julieta just talked about, uh, that if, uh, if there's a, pr a particular neighborhood with, say, for example, a high rate of diabetes, uh, often people's assumptions will be that, that common default frame about, well, that community is just making poor choices around nutrition or what to drink. Um, you know, if somebody is uh, talking about um, punitive, uh, 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 punitive uh, policies at a particular school uh, with children being late to school or tardiness, people will often fault those children for, you know, not being organized enough or not getting up early enough to get to school on time. Um, and, and getting those tardy slips when they may not look at the bigger picture of whether there's transportation available, um, whether their parents are working perhaps, and um, you know you have two working parents and maybe it's harder for the child to get to school on time. So again, it's looking at that larger landscape that we have to make sure and cue first because when we talk about health inequity, unfortunately, a lot of people are going to go to that default frame. And here's an example of that, uh, that idea of that default frame. So, for example, if you say people who live in neighborhood X, so that could be any neighborhood in your community, are three times likely to have diabetes, often the way people will translate that message is, people living in that particular neighborhood are simply making bad choices. Um, uh, they're buying too many sugar-sweetened beverages. They're buying too much junk food. Uh, those types of default frames uh, will immediately come to mind as opposed to looking at that landscape and seeing whether people have access to healthy foods. Are there food deserts? Do their schools serve nutritious foods? Um, uh, nutritious meals. Do they have safe routes to school to get to school on uh, to get to school and get the physical activity they need? Are there joint use policies perhaps in their communities where they can exercise and get some physical activity after school? So again, what we what we uh, want to avoid is allowing our uh, our audiences to fall into that default frame. So what can we do to, uh, to sort of reframe the conversation? Well, the first thing we need to do is just what I'm talking about. Understand that those default frames are going to be front and center and that people are automatically going to go to that personal responsibility frame that if a community is, is having health issues, it's because it's their fault. So we need to make sure that that common assumption is going to be a starting point for a lot of people's uh, uh, thinking around a health issue. So what do we do about that? We need to
to make sure that we translate those individual health problems to that larger environmental picture. So we need to make sure that we cue the environment, talk about access, talk about resources, talk about all of the things that, uh, that make a community healthier uh, on a larger structural level, and cue those, uh, cue those messages first. We also need to re assign responsibility for a solution. So we need to make sure that we not only talk about the health problem in a community, but that we highlight the solution. There's nothing worse than everyone throwing their hands up in the air and thinking that there's no, that thinking that there's no solution. Um, so we want to make sure that we talk about um, solutions such as increasing access to farmers' markets, uh, promoting um, active uh, transport and work uh, uh, to improve access to safe streets, making bike lanes uh, more accessible, uh, making sidewalks better for pedestrians, um, you know, uh, perhaps in communities where there are what's often referred to as food deserts, that there are uh, healthy stores in that neighborhood, that there are farmers markets or perhaps edible uh, gardens. And, uh, and, and in another sort of structural sense, we want to make sure that, that our uh, uh, schools, uh, our, our, our state offices, hospitals, every sort of uh, a public facility that we encounter is having has healthy food and beverage standards, so that we're not uh, we're not just faced with when we're thirsty a vending machine that only sells sugary drinks. Um, uh, so I, you get the idea about this 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 idea of of having solutions and not just painting a picture of the problem. Um, another point that we um, uh, that we make about how to reframe the conversation is make sure and articulate a value in your message, which both Julieta and I uh, have mentioned uh, in in this discussion. Make sure that your audience isn't just getting the information, meaning the data, the uh, the uh, the anecdotal evidence. Uh, all of the all of the information that we often get about a health problem in a community, but also why it matters, and uh, so we're not just reaching our audiences' uh, minds, but also touching their hearts uh, when we're talking about a health problem. So when I mean a value, you know. Uh, Everyone should have the opportunity to thrive. Everyone should have their opportunity to realize their potential. Uh, another value, uh, common value, is pride of place. Uh, uh, Stockton, for example, uh, we can say is a community that you know children deserve to realize their potential. All children deserve to realize their potential, no matter where they live. So those are the kinds of values that we want to make sure that our messages uh, are infused with. And then last, we can support our frame in verbal as well as nonverbal ways uh, with visuals and other um, what we call story elements, which uh, we will discuss in a few minutes. Thanks, Fernando. And part of the reason also, we know that you all are great about detailing all the facts and figures about how bad things are in terms of, well, really, you know, what the rates of disease are, what the rates are, of, et cetera, like how, how people, you know, just making people feel like this is urgent, but we need people to feel hope as well. So that's why that some solution is so important. So um, we are now going to take some time to practice. And so we're, we've spent some time talking about assumptions, people's starting points, and we can't assume people are coming from the same place as we are. So I'm going to read um, a, um, a made-up quote that um, that we've developed to, to kind of that captures some of the sentiments that we've heard around some of the issues you all are working on. And I'm going to I'm going to see. I'd love you know to get a sense 
if this resonates with anyone. Um, I don't know why people are spending time and energy trying to change what neighborhood food vendors and restaurants serve. I think the food they serve is just fine. If people want to eat better, they should make healthier food at home. Why are bureaucrats trying to take away the food that I enjoy? So that's one thing. I mean, there may be some people that that resonates. They've heard something similar around. I know that there are a lot of people working to improve um, the food offered in child care settings. A lot of people are working to increase the whether or not schools and um, participate in farm to school food. Um, also, just increasing wellness policies and after school programs. If those are things you're working on, that may be something you've heard where people say, hey, why are you trying to change after school food? I mean, I think it's fine if you don't like the food that your kid is being offered there, why don't you just pack him a lunch? I don't understand. So this is just an example of a default frame, one that's a starting off point that actually probably many people hold. Not, it's actually the, the, I would say the majority of people hold sentiments that resemble this quote. Here's a way that we feel, so a lot of what we do here is reframing. So we need to understand where people are coming from and we need to go from the portrait, which really puts the focus on individuals and individuals just working really hard to make better choices and expand it to the landscape. The landscape, port, through the landscape perspective shows the many factors outside of a person's control. So um, we're, here's a way that we try to reframe this. All right, so of course we're all responsible for staying healthy, but far too many meals, especially those sold in fast food restaurants and by neighborhood vendors, are high in sugar, fat, and salt. All residents of Long Beach deserve to thrive and realize their potential. Unfortunately, poor nutrition and its related diseases are limiting our opportunities. By working with vendors and restaurants to improve many selections and marketing of healthier items, we're building a better future for our community. So in this reframe, we've really made sure that, it's, um, that we show that, well, okay, there's some factors outside of a person's control. And that's, some, that's something that we really want people to underline in the reframe. We've also included a lot of values. So values are that all residents deserve to thrive. So, and try to place, as Fernando mentioned, your city, you know, that's an important thing to reference because often, I mean, it's not, you don't, there's no prescriptive message. Well, these are just ideas for you all to take what seems to fit best because you all know best what's, what'll work in your communities. But many communities try to place as a very effective way to bring in decision makers. And also this idea of looking towards the future and the importance of future generations, that's an important value. So um, I, I want to make sure that, oh, so we're, I'm just reading a, a comment here from Jessica Alvarez who, um, who included that quality of life is an important value that, um, and quality of life and, and, and opportunities are values that she references when she's um, messaging. And um, I, definitely, I definitely want to underline that those are two essential values that speak to a lot of, very broad range. Those are very, here in the United States, opportunity is a really key, crucial value. I mean, the idea that we want, that the dream is that all children have the opportunity to succeed and all people can be healthy. So that's something that, um, that's really important. So, um, so I, I just want to note that, Jessica, a lot of the values that she's touching on, we really want to underline are really important ones. Um, and I want to add uh, that uh, Jessica... Um, really, uh, there's a challenge in her question about, um, uh, you know, how everyone from her community uh, can um, sort of buy into this idea of fair and equal access and fair and equal resources for everyone. But it looks like uh, oftentimes we run against this idea there's two communities. It, it, it almost sounds like one that gets all the resources and benefits and another community that's sort of left behind. So, uh, Jessica, I just want you to hold on to that thought because we're going to talk about um, what to do when you encounter a challenge such as yours where we need to really link the issue to an entire community. So that's my short sort of response to your question, and we'll elaborate on that in just a little bit. Great. Great. So thanks, um, thanks, for that, Fernando. So we're going to now. We want to hear from you all. So we sense that we presented this default frame, which is the fact that why are people trying to 
change neighborhoods for food, um, if people want to be healthy, they should just make better choices. So this is focused purely on individuals, saying individuals just need to get it together, and I don't know why you all are trying to make metal and make these changes. It's really just up to individuals. If that's, if that's the case, um, then we're, you know, we thought of our reframe. We offered that to you all. And now we want everyone to, or we want people to spend a moment and think, what are some of the default frames, some of the common assumptions you are struggling, that you are fighting against, that you are facing? Such as uh, government intervention is a common one. We've all heard this idea of, you know, nanny state and government bureaucrats telling us what to do. That's a very common default frame that we're off, often up against. And the other major one being uh, the one we just talked about, that you know, that children's health is really a, a, a parent's responsibility, and that outside of the home, that really um, there's there's no accountability. So those are two very common default frames that we've touched upon. What are some other ones that you all can think of uh, that uh, that often challenge the work that you're doing? And it's something that Fernando's mentioned, one of the ones he mentioned, resonate, please just type it in. We just want to get a sense. What are you up against? What are some assumptions that are making it harder for you to get the work done that you need, that you, the changes you want to see in your community? So feel free, if you want to raise your hand um, and say it out loud, that's total, that works well too. If not, you can type it into the, ta the chat box. Yes, yeah, so we just heard from Christian Tucker, um, nanny state, get the government out of my kids' schools. It's definitely something, you know, hey, you know, if you if you don't like the food they serve in schools, oh, that's fine. Just pack your kid a better lunch. Has anyone ever heard that before? Does that resonate at all? Governments are taking away our freedom by telling us what to do and how to behave. Yes, that is something we're often up against. I, you know, some people are working on healthy retail, and they're saying, "Why are, why is this the government? Why is the government getting involved with what retail stores are doing?" We also have from Heather, uh, Chris. It's not up to us to regulate people's choices. So that's another sort of similar default frame uh, that goes along with uh, why are governments taking away our freedom? Um, from Cedra, the concern that limiting choices is not culturally sensitive. Uh, for example, vendor carts uh, outside of schools. So there's an idea where uh, a community's needs or cultural sort of uh, 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 context uh, can sometimes seem to be at odds with policy. Um, so we've got so we've got a whole bunch of good ones here. Yeah, we have a lot of really great um, ways that people are understanding that we're actually these are the common ideas that are making it harder for us to do our job. I saw some more that any good business is good business. That's an important thing for us to pull from because when we're thinking about effective messaging, well then that means that maybe we can speak to the economic impact and the economic need to have a healthy um, to have a healthy community and the health impact that can have. So these are, it's important to understand the values that are implicit in the, the default frames that we're up against. So yeah, so um, we, we see from Juven, well, we already have all these great programs. Why, why are we trying to change things? You know, it seems like we have great ways to, great programs already. Why are you trying to make systems changes? It just seems uh, like overkill. Um, this idea from Deidre that making changes would hurt small business, that's a very uh, common and challenging um, uh, pushback that we often get. Um, and we forget that uh, the business community has just as much of a stake in having healthy communities as uh, parents and children. Um, and we just have to make sure that that voice is included um, and we're going to talk about the idea of, of having authentic voices that can speak to a health issue from, from a, a variety of, of different perspectives 
including the business community. So um, we have uh, some great examples of common default frames that uh, those, those assumptions that people have that really put the focus on individual responsibility. So now, let's try our hand at how you would reframe um, those, uh, those common default uh, assumptions that, that people make. So how would you counter those default frames and include some of those factors, some of those structural uh, factors outside of a person's control that undermine their, their uh, efforts to stay healthy. So we have the example, I'll just go back to the example. So this was the reframe. So this is the reframe. So when someone said it's just up to the individual, um, we reframed it and said, you know what, actually it is our duty, it's our responsibility to make sure that all residents in X city have the upper, deserve to thrive and realize and it's our duty to help them. Um, so, so this is a great, Heather has a great reframe. Do you want to share Heather's reframe? Sure. How are people going to make choices if there is no healthy choice? Education and awareness of what the choices are lead to real personal choice. So here's an example. And that actually, we could also include access in there because I'm sure that also that Heather's working, we know that Heather's probably also working on access, but it's hard to make a choice when there is no, when you're really left, it's, there's no real choice there. And here's a great reframe from Deidre. As a parent, I want the school to support the healthy habits I'm teaching my children at home. What a great um, reframe that I actually haven't heard this worded this way. So this is a great example of how we can say, sure, uh, we, all have, uh, uh, we, we all have a role in staying healthy, and parents also have an important role in staying healthy, but we need help, or parents need help. And, and that includes uh, those environments where uh, their children spend so much time, so much part of the day, that's where uh, we need to make sure that we're consistent and continue those healthy uh, nutritional habits that we started at home. Christians is also a really great reframe. Do you want to share that? Sure. The school leaders actually want this school to be healthier. It's not just the government. We are just helping the school organize their own health changes. That's another uh, great reframe that, um, that we haven't heard worded this way. So this really is a testament to how, with some thought and creativity, and you know, this is just uh, an example that's taken a couple of minutes, we can really cue the environment, cue that landscape, and make sure that we're showing that uh, that health, is, uh, that good health, is not just about uh, personal choices. And so the underlying message that we hope comes through is. Sometimes we can start messaging in a vacuum. Where we're coming through our own context, we assume that people have the same understanding and the same values as we do, and so we'll start from that point. Instead of saying, actually, we know what the concerns are. People are worried about government intervention, if that's a concern in your specific community. It's not all communities have different default frames or assumptions they're battling against, but if that's the case, then the, the reframe that Christian has provided, Christian Tucker, is really a great way to say, you know what, we're not coming here from our high and mighty place and telling schools what to do. We're working with school leaders. This is a collaborative effort, and we're here because there's a, there's a desire and there's a need and there's demand to make changes from within the school. It's a great way to reframe and take away power from that default frame. Same with, same with um, Elani, who is... Um, who is saying that uh, a healthier community will ensure businesses will enjoy customers to support their businesses for a very long time. You know, that is a way to bring in the business community. We're not, no one, we all of us want strong businesses in our communities. We all support business. That is not something that, that's a common value. We want businesses to thrive. We just want them to thrive in a way that supports our children's and our, and our family's health. So great. Um, this is, 
Um, this is a great way. We have another one from Ruben. It's, um, it says, I don't know about you, but I would like to raise a family in a happy and healthy environment and neighborhood. Developing healthier neighborhoods will attract more families and businesses to your region. And something we really want to underline about this message is we want to very much connect to all the aspirational and hopeful feelings we have our, about our community. Because the truth is, it's so you all have solutions and strategies that work. So it's a really wonderful thing to be able to offer. We're, it's a really great position to be in. So we really want to connect to that when we message. So great, so this is the first and second step. We have to understand default frames. We have to spend some time practicing your framing. And then um, we want to focus, so we include what's wrong, what's the problem we want to address, why does it matter, so the values, what would happen if nothing were done, why is this so urgent, why should we act now, and then what are the specific actions we want people to take? What are, what are the next steps? Because we don't want to just leave it as we want healthier choices. What does that look like specifically? Because it's pretty vague. It's hard to picture. Or that we want the community to come together is another common uh, solution statement that really leaves uh, no real solution. Exactly. So you all have done all this hard work of, of identifying some great solutions. And if, if we all know that, you know what? Um, increasing access to farmers markers, markets through EBT and um, increasing the basically the amount of veggies people can buy with their EBT, if that's something that we know makes a difference, then we need to put that front and center because people are hungry for solutions. Literally, they, they want to hear about that these issues can be addressed. So these are the main components of, a, of an effective message. And we really, I just want to underline again, you all are very good about making the case about the problem. We want more of an emphasis on the solution and the values. All right. So we have, um, I've mentioned that we want to link the practical steps. So we want to really um, engage people, either parents, community members, um, anyone that really can support our work into, well, what needs to happen? What would this look like? And we don't need to get into that first. We really want to make sure that they care and understand the values. That's really key. Um, but we really want to make sure that, so as we know, with any, anyone doing around work around health equity knows that if you have disparities, if you have inequities in outcome, if you have some people in your community that are really not at the same, experiencing the same level of health and don't have the same access to physical activity and nutritious foods, et cetera, it affects the whole community, and it's something that really impacts your whole region, your whole city. And so this is, a, I want to get back to the question earlier uh, from Jessica Alvarez about quality of life and the challenge that she faces in making that case for, you know, an entire community um, should be healthy. And, and so uh, I wanted to just go back to this question because I think what Julieta is talking about now really speaks to this question of how we can link this issue to all of us and how we talk about that. Exactly. So um, we sometimes, sometimes it's easy to just even tag on. We'll say something, and we have to be very careful. We can't just say, um, because as we mentioned earlier, it's going to be misinterpreted. So if we say, well, X community experiences rates of disease five times higher than why community, we can't assume that's necessarily going to make people come to and ask because they're going to say, well, you know, those people are making those bad choices and why don't they get it together? So the assumptions, they're not going to understand the larger context because we haven't painted that larger picture. We can't assume that they're on the board already. So that's the first thing. So we need to paint that larger picture, show the landscape, show the many factors outside of a person's control that impacts their health. Once we've done that, we really need them to understand values-wise in terms of why it's important for all of us. So sometimes we'll even end things with saying, after all, unless, um, you know, we can't thrive as, we, Long Beach cannot survive unless we all thrive. And that happens through all of our children having an opportunity to learn, and kids can't learn unless they have access to healthy foods, because we know that food is essential for kids to, healthy food is essential for kids to really um, optimize their learning in, in classrooms and stay focused. So that's a way that even someone who maybe they just think, hey, you got some kids that, you know, I, you know, I, I went to school and I never had people, um, you know, I'm giving me food, you know, why should we support um, healthy foods in schools? Well, this is, you know, we need to make that, show that, 
make that connection to the larger community. All right, so we need to um, go back to, do, to that slide that I showed you all around the body and how these issues, different inequities, manifest in the bodies. And then lastly, we need to tell the story with words and pictures that help our audience connect and see. So we want to do everything we can to get away from jargon. And I really recommend that everyone practice talking to their family members, their neighbors, their anyone around these issues and make see if they get on board, see if they're excited. If they don't understand what you're saying, then we need to start over. We need to make sure we exclude jargon from our conversation. Some groups what they do is they have a little they have a little jar during their meetings and everyone gets uh, some safety pins and every time someone says a jargon word, a word that people don't really um, you know consider it's just not something that your grandmother would understand. They have to put their safety pin in the little jar. Whatever you can do to help practice, we really recommend that. So, so instead of a swear jar, a yeah, jargon jar. Exactly. So I'm going to um, leave it to Fernando to spend the next few minutes just wrapping up with some ideas on how you can use visuals and other, and other tools to communicate your message. Thanks, Julieta. So um, I, I mentioned briefly this idea of story elements and how they can help support your frame or reframe of an issue. So uh, there, there are wonderful verbal ways and nonverbal ways, but uh, with the verbal communication, we often say that the uh, messenger is just as important as the message itself. So when you're thinking about who can deliver your message, uh, get creative and think about those voices from a number of from from a variety of walks of life, of experiences. Uh, of perspectives that can talk about why your solution to a health problem in your community is so important, why it's a workable solution, and why everyone should support it. So here we have an example of a, of a youth. Uh, Eric is a youth researcher. Youth make fantastic, authentic voices. They speak from a voice, uh, they speak from a place of, of, of authenticity, they speak from a place of passion and um, and can really make an issue come alive through their through their eyes through their perspective. So youth um, youth are great. Um, here we have another example of Alme, a Yurok tribal member, um, and so uh, uh, people who can really speak uh, to an issue from learned experience. Uh, from their own uh, 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 current experience is something that can add a lot of value to a message. Um, and then we have a, a third example of uh, Lakeisha, who's a champion mom who is out there supporting uh, 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 her kids and other youth efforts to make changes in their community so that they can be healthier. So there's an example of authentic voices. Visuals is another strong way to support your frame. The old adage that a picture is worth a thousand words really holds true when we're trying to think of ways to support our message. And they can be uh, visuals that uh, show, uh, that, uh, that clearly uh, show the problem such as this visual here where we have a chain link fence with a beautiful schoolyard and facility that would, uh, that would show how a joint use agreement would really help a community. And then on the right we have a picture of a clean water fountain from Del Norte High School. So here we can also show a visual that not only illustrates the problem, but an aspirational uh, uh, visual that, that can show me, um, that can show what something can look like if it's improved. Um, and then we have this idea of social math, and that's a way of making numbers more understandable or putting context around numbers. Often, when we talk about a health concern or health problem that we're trying to address in our community, we often will say, you know, X number of community members are impacted by this health issue, uh, or the number of 
uh, children that we see with uh, diabetes or asthma or other health issues is X in this community. Well, we want to put a little context around those numbers. Otherwise, those numbers can be seen as uh, 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 just numbers. And we may think, well, is that a lot? Is that a little bit? Should I be concerned? So sometimes when we can put that context around a number, it helps us visualize the problem a little better. So here we have some examples around um, pedestrian safety. Uh, and we could have said easily that in the United States, we have X number of pedestrian fatalities. So instead, we say something like every two hours, a pedestrian dies from a, a crash-related accident in the U.S., or, or even taking that a step further and saying, in the time it takes the average American to shower, a pedestrian in the U.S. will suffer a crash-related uh, injury. And then similarly, an adult would have to walk three miles to burn off the calories in a 20-ounce soda. And then uh, last, we have this idea of media bites. Your message uh, can take a couple of minutes or it can take uh, several minutes, but what people will walk away with are those short, pithy, memorable statements that you make that can be embedded in your message and that can, if, 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 if somebody walks away with anything, it'll be those uh, short, pithy uh, uh, statements that you make. And here are a couple of examples. Great. So you all can just take a look at that. So um, we're, before we close out, we just want to give an opportunity to refer you all to um, to Mitri is on the line. And if we really want people to think about how they can connect the work they're doing to the work that's happening statewide, so please, you know, join the movement. Um, and you can follow California Champions for Change on Facebook and just stay up to date and use resources and see where it connects to your work. And we want to make sure that you all have our contact information because we'd love to support your work any way we can. Please follow us on Facebook and Twitter, um, and like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and also just feel free to email us at any point. And um, we'll send out a thank you. If you um, in the thank you link, you'll have a place where you can access the, the archive. So please refer to your NIA program officer or Jackie Richardson. And we really want to thank everyone for taking the time with us. If you have any questions on your systems change work, um, then definitely contact your NEOP um, program officer or Jackie Richardson. So thank you all. We really want to thank, um, uh, the okay, the recording will be available at bmsg.org in about a week. So um, everyone can access the recording there. Thank you all for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Julieta and Fernando. I, I think that um, feedback and participation on the chat kind of speaks for itself. We really appreciate having your expertise and making yourself available for um, as a resource to a local health departments that are doing their work. So um, thank you guys so much, and thank everybody for joining. I hope that this was beneficial. Um, yeah, I, you are seeing it through the chat. So everybody have a great rest of your day, and um, as Julieta said, if you have any other needs or questions or would like to just take advantage of their, the great resource that they have to offer, please do reach out to them. Thank you so much. Thank you.